Good morning. morning. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ on this, the eve of Christmas Day, celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, this being the fourth Sunday of Advent and Christmas Eve. This is our soul fourth Sunday of Advent service, and so we welcome all who are present here, all who are with us online, and encourage those who are online, who are new, that we do have the order of worship available on today's worship page at pensvalleyparish.info. A couple of announcements I want to draw your attention to. The first and most important one is we did have a change in our schedule for next Sunday. So although it says in the bulletin we'll follow our regular worship schedule, that is not true. We will not have worship here at Trinity. Uh, you will have Sunday school at 9.30, but we will not have worship at 8.30 next Sunday. We will resume the following Sunday. We will have services at St. James at 9.45 and at Spruce Town next Sunday at 11. If you would like to attend there, you're welcome to do so. Also, just a reminder, some things that are coming up in the new year. We have something new that we're going to start called First Wednesday and Third Wednesday Bible Studies. We're going to have the first Wednesday Bible studies at Spruce Town at 10, from 10 a.m. to 11.30. And the third Sunday uh, studies will be held 10 to 11.30, hosted at St. James. They're just open to anyone. It's a traditional Bible study. You bring your Bible and we read through it. We're going to start in the book of Matthew and go through the Gospels. So if you'd like to join us, you're welcome to. If you know someone who might be interested, invite them to come as well. Anyone and everyone can come. And as far as Trinity uh, events coming up soon, please take note of January 15th when we have our trustees and ad board meeting. And also January 17th when we have the first quarter reorganizational meeting of the charge-wide staff parish relations committee. They will meet on the 17th of January, 7 p.m. at St. James in Coburn. Are there any other announcements to share this morning? Then seeing none, I want to draw your attention to our centering words for today. Glorify God this day. Magnify the Lord with all your heart. Sing praises to God who reigns above. Glorify the Lord with gladness. Would you please rise in body or in spirit to prepare our hearts for worship by singing together the sanctuary song. call to worship. Stop. Listen. Pay attention. Love is coming near. We wait in the love of the coming Messiah that us. The hope bringer, peacemaker, joy sustainer grows in a womb, preparing to be born among us. With Mary, we long for the coming of the child who will transform the world, bringing justice where injustice reigns, fullness where hunger persists, and favor to the ones the world calls lowly. So let us join our voices and our lives in magnifying God, our Savior. We come to the week and to declare the coming of the love that transforms us. Amen. We continue now with the opening prayer. Holy God of joy, we rejoice in the reality of who you are. We live within the joy of your love for us. Our contentment comes and goes. Our happiness ebbs and flows. Our feelings depend upon our circumstances, our physical health, our brain chemistry. 
but our joy is deeply rooted in our identity as your beloved children. And we give you thanks. Amen. Would you please turn in the United Methodist hymnal to number 218 as we sing together our opening hymn, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. Hastening on by prophets seen of old, with the ever circling years, when with the ever circling years rather come the time foretold. So, in preparation for Jesus' second coming, we wait and we bring gifts to be blessed by God so that others may know. So, let us prepare those to bless those gifts by singing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Gracious and generous God, we offer our gifts to you, knowing that the energy exerted in our giving is minuscule compared to what we've expended finding the gifts for our families and friends. You've given us a glimpse of the gift you truly seek in the angel's conversation with Mary, when told she, who told her rather that she would give birth to our Savior. And to that, she simply said, yes, let it be according to your word. And may that affirmation of faith and obedience be the gift we offer this day. It's in Christ that we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. There are always things that we pray over because we want to hold them in confidence. We don't share them out loud when we share at this time, but we can share them in the silence of prayer, which is why we always go to God in silent prayer first, and then we all pray together. So let us so bow and pray now. Heavenly Father, we lift up to you all of those people and concerns that we've mentioned out loud and in the silence of prayer. 
We know that you are a great God. You can do anything. You are an all-powerful, all-knowing God. And yet, Lord, we can't quite imagine what it must have been like for Mary. As difficult as our lives might seem or as challenging as some of the requests made of us, for Mary to hear God's request through an angel, to respond then unconditionally with yes. We have a tendency to put conditions on everything. We want it to be convenient. We want it to work into our schedule. We want to know that we have, we want to know exactly what we have to do. We want to know the timeline. We want to know how long it's going to take. What's in it for us? What are the projected outcomes? Mary knew none of these things, only that she was favored. So we ask you to forgive our faithlessness, Lord, and slow us down. Cause us to take time to really consider the wonderful ways that you've always worked in our lives. As we've come before you with concerns on our hearts and our, for our families and friends and for the world and our community, certainly remind us that your presence is with us and that your healing love comforts and restores us. We ask you that you would open our hearts and our ears to the cries of those who are in need, whose needs are so much greater than our own. And let us use our talents and resources that you have provided in order to help others. And give us courage in the doing, give us energy for the task and enthusiasm as we do this work for you in your world. You call us to be loving people of prayer. So let us now share the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare for the lighting of the Advent candle of love, I would enjoy, uh, invite you to take out your order of worship and join in the liturgy for the lighting. When the angel Gabriel visited Mary, announcing God's plan for her to conceive and give birth to the Messiah, Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I am a virgin? And yet only a few months later, Mary sings to Elizabeth, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. We, like Mary, hear God's call to be part of making God's dream for our salvation and flourishing a reality. And we question, how can this be? I am only dot, dot, dot. Yet, like Mary, the onlys that make us hesitate are gifts God can and will use as God's love transforms us into bearers of good news. We light these candles as a sign of our shocking hope, our just peace, our fierce joy, and the love that transforms us. May love grow within us, transforming us into bold witnesses of God's salvation with our voices and our lives. Amen.
Would you please remain seated as we sing our hymn of preparation? We will go to number 204 and sing together, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. Our first scripture passage comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 to 11, and then I will read also verse 16. In this, David proposes building a house for God, but God responds by promising to establish David and his people forever. So hear these words. David, David has a plan to build a temple. Now it came about when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all his enemies, that the king said to Nathan, the prophet, see now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. Nathan said to the king, go, do all that is in your mind for the Lord is with you. But in the same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, Go and say to my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. Whether I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. Nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly, even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Our second reading comes from the book of Romans, and in this reading, Paul is praising God to the church in Rome. And he's talking about the advent of Christ as a great mystery that's now revealed. So hear these words from Romans 16, verses 25 to 27. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the, all the nations, leading to obedience of faith, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. In our final reading, the angel Gabriel announces to Mary the birth of a child. This is Jesus' birth foretold, Luke 1, verses 26 to 38. Now in the sixth month, 
the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who is called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In 2 Samuel, we hear that David has a great idea. Anybody here ever had a great idea? I think my great idea started at a very early age. And I would have a great idea, and I would share my great idea with my parents, and my parents would tell me it wasn't such a great idea. This is basically what's happening with David, because David, his great idea is he wants to build a house for God. And his trusted friend Nathan says, well, why not? <laughs> but David's timing was not God's timing. So the idea might have been valid, but the timing was not. And so God tells Nathan to tell David to put this on the back burner for now. When it's the right time, God will take care of it. And David's vision, although I said it might have been good, but I think as far as the idea, but his vision could have very well been a grand house on a high hill, whereas God had something a little simpler, a little small place maybe in the middle of town. Whatever the reason, because it doesn't say, God affirms that his house will be built when the time is right by the one who is right to build it, and so they are to be ready. God doesn't say no, God says not now. But they are to be ready. And in order to be ready, one must get ready, right? When you were getting ready for church, you weren't ready till you were done getting ready, right? So we need to be ready. How many of you are ready for Christmas? I got one hand. <laughs> one hand. So some of you are still, how many of you are still getting ready for Christmas? Okay, you'll be ready later today, okay. There's also, uh, there's no time in my life where uh, ready or not, here it comes, because really when you look at the calendar, guess what, ready or not, here it comes. Uh, there was no other time in my life where ready or not, here he comes applied more appropriately than the day my son was born. Now everything was in place as far as, you know, we knew that he would be arriving some point soon, it was close to the due date. We had everything ready to go, the crib's ready, we have everything set up in his room. And everything is in place. We were ready, but we still did not know the day or the, the hour, right? You just don't know unless you schedule it, which we did with the second one, which is a whole lot easier when you schedule it. But when you don't have it scheduled, even though you're ready, you really don't know when. And, and so I was a little bit nervous about what, when the time would come. Is it going to be convenient? Is it going to be the middle of the night? Can we do this in the morning, right? Can we just, can, you know, don't you do that when you're trying to figure out how something should go? The, you have literally no control over. But when the time comes, the time has come. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we consider one future mother who has tried for years 
to get pregnant and couldn't. And another future mother who has not even thought about having a baby so soon who's not known a man, remind us again that with God, all things are possible. May the words heard be yours and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. It's in your son's name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Mary was at the age when young ladies are ready to marry. So she spent her years getting ready to marry. And so it was not a shocker, but rather a wonderful joy that a suitable husband was found in Joseph, that all the necessary arrangements, because there are many, there are dowries to consider and, and who gets what gifts and things like that. But all of those arrangements are completed. They have to perform the marriage tradition also as a family. Mary was ready to get married. In fact, two of the three parts of the marriage tradition have already taken place, and so she was legally married, but had not completed the third part. Was Mary ready for motherhood? Well, she spent all this time getting ready to be a wife. I don't think that she thought of motherhood as being so soon on the cusp as it ended up being, but how about ready for motherhood that's not just any, but to carry and raise God's son. Certainly getting ready to get married to Joseph, she thought about Joseph's son. She probably thought about maybe many children with Joseph. But she's not yet fully married to Joseph, which would be the first tangible step in her adult life. No wonder she was confused when the angel approached her and called her favored. Favored by God for what? This is what she was perplexed about. For what? Because in Mary's day, much like our day today, you, you earned favor. Favor was based on what you did that was exceptional. So could she be favored because she is marrying Joseph? Could she be favored because of where she's going to live? She really didn't understand, but that wasn't it. Mary is favored for what she's about to do. It's a little bit like graduating high school. They celebrate not so much the accomplishment of finishing school, but what you are about to do. At weddings, we celebrate not so much that you dated. <laughs> we celebrate what you are about to do. Every plan and expectation of how her life with Joseph will be has now completely changed. There are a lot of complications that come in with this command. When life throws you a curveball, what do you do? Well, some seek out the counsel of another for whom life has thrown curveballs, right? So we have those people, hopefully, in our lives that we can seek out. And Mary's relative, Elizabeth, is decades older and she and her husband, Zechariah, tried for many years to have a baby. And when it didn't happen, they made their peace with it, sort of, as much as one can. They accepted, for whatever reason, that they would not become parents. And they cared for children in their own ways. But why would God see fit first to set the stage for Mary by ensuring first that Elizabeth is pregnant with John? Would you ever wonder? We talked last week about how John the Baptist's wilderness experience was meant to prepare him for Jesus and how Jesus' wilderness experience prepared him for ministry. And now we have Elizabeth, John's mother, preparing for motherhood, now preparing Mary, mother of Jesus, for the same. Now, John is certainly a miracle baby, much loved and adored by his parents long before he was born. He was wanted and thought about for decades. Elizabeth likely couldn't stop talking about it, and we know Zechariah wasn't able to talk about it again after learning about it until he was born. When Zechariah voiced disbelief about the angel's message from God, he was struck mute until the baby was born. I guess if he couldn't say anything positive and supportive, which is exactly what Elizabeth would be needing, think about it. Decades of sadness and heartbreak. What is it that Elizabeth is going to need more than anything? 
positivity and support. Perhaps seeing that that might not be possible, he would say nothing at all. The differences between Elizabeth's and Mary's pregnancy situations were vastly different. Elizabeth has been married for years. She knows Zechariah in and out. She can probably figure out where he's going before he knows where he's going, right? She knows her husband very well. She has a lot of life experience. She's had a lot of ups and downs in her marriage. Her pregnancy is wonderful, welcome news, although unexpected, and that some who hear about it may not understand. Why in the world is she having a baby at her age? That's irresponsible. Mary is not all, at all the, the way, not all the way married. She has not completed that third step in the marriage process. But she's learning more and more about Joseph all of the time. She hadn't taken care of her own household yet, but she looks forward to it. And although her pregnancy is wonderful because of what she knows about the identity of that baby. Altogether unexpected, some will hear about this baby and not understand. Oh, it's God's son. Okay. Elizabeth and Mary credit God for making their motherhood possible. Elizabeth lived with impossible for a very long time. Was it necessary for Gabriel to come to Mary so that she could believe rather than going to Joseph first? Could the extremes of what is possible for God prove to each of them that there is nothing God cannot do? No reputation that cannot be rebuilt. No pain too unbearable. No hard situation too hopeless and no sin unforgivable. We may believe that our faith must be grounded in readily believing without much evidence or absolute certainty without question. Then again, being certain what we know is true and possible has a way of turning God's plans or opportunities for us into impossibilities instead of blessed surprises. Oh no, not now. <clears throat> Later on can become, thank God, Perfect timing. Our faith, like that of Elizabeth and Mary, needs a middle ground that exists between the extremes of what we understand is possible if the Holy Spirit is to have any room to move or breathe or expand. How would creating that middle ground change how we interact with the world, how we engage with the Christmas story, or relate to our own brothers and sisters in Christ? The middle ground creates space for positive what-ifs. Think about how we speak. We use indicative statements. Indicative statements are factual statements about what's happening or what is real, very basic factual things. For example, I go to Bethlehem. The other side of the space may be subjunctive case, which holds all the nuances of possibilities and potentialities, such as, I could go to Bethlehem, I would go to Bethlehem, I might go to Bethlehem. Do you see how the possibilities differ between I go to Bethlehem and I might go to Bethlehem? Remember that idea of ready or not, here he comes. When, it, when uh, talking about giving birth, that is, well, the Indicative truth on April 24th of 1994 was that my due date was any day now, really, and this child will be evicted at some point from his current dwelling. But being too rooted in the indicative can prevent us from considering alternate possibilities. I think as a first-time mom, I thought a due date was pretty solid, so I figured it was probably going to be on that date. And on the 24th of April, I wasn't very happy with that truth. I spent Sunday, April 24th, 1994, in and out of tears because I wanted to hold my baby. <laughs> I didn't want to be pregnant anymore, and I didn't want my ankles to be swollen anymore. I didn't want to go to work the next day. 
it was Monday the next day and I would have to go to work. As I had decided, of course, I will work right up to the time I give birth. I feel really bad for Brian because I was a handful that day. There was nothing he could do to console me. I think he even took me for a ride in the car. I mean, he was like pulling out all of the stops. I went on and on, and I was just stuck in that indicative truth, unable to harness the subjunctive, unable to imagine not just the possible, I'm going to have this baby, I've never had one before, I hope it goes okay. Ooh, I'm thinking about what that means. Did you ever do that when you were first time? I couldn't imagine just the possible along with the impossible, the what-if scenarios that were positive. In the wee hours of April 25th, around 3 a.m., I woke up, and I was feeling a little uncomfortable, and I went downstairs, and I noticed the moon was almost full, and it was very large, and I went downstairs because I decided, well, I'm not going to disturb Brian, let him get a couple more hours of sleep since we have to go to work. And so I laid down on the couch, and I watched some TV, and I monitored myself, and I let Brian sleep. But by 7 a.m., we had both called off of work. And by mid-afternoon, we were holding baby Evan, and I wasn't pregnant anymore. That night in the hospital, I looked out the hospital window at the full moon that existed April 25th in 1994. And I marveled at how Evan's ear his entire ear was the same size as the top of my thumb. What a difference a day makes. We should, like Mary and Elizabeth, cling to the indicative, the real nature of who God is, but we should do so so that we can fully embrace who we are and yet hold on to the incredible subjunctive of what God can do. Do you think God heard me on Sunday? Do you think he maybe heard Brian? <laughs> Please, God, do something with this woman. But like Mary and Elizabeth, we're called to connect the dots between the God whom we know and have always known and the God who is responsively and lovingly guiding our future. But reminding us, and sometimes very subtle, and not so, sometimes not very subtle at all ways, that he sees us and he hears our longings. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, on so many Sundays we come before you in prayer and ask you to do various things for us, to give us that which we cannot achieve for ourselves, to fix problems in our lives or in the lives of others or in the world that we know we, we simply cannot fix by ourselves. Today, we stand upon the eve of your incarnation. Our prayers to you are pure praise. You've acted decisively on our behalf. You've given us a gift we could not earn or des deserve, the gift of yourself, your love made manifest and present to us in the birth of the baby in Bethlehem. Handing that beautiful baby over to wonderful women who were willing to do what was needed to care for that Christ. We therefore praise you and give thanks to you with full-throated joy because in the child of Mary, you've withheld nothing of yourself and we are able to hold back nothing of our praise and worship of him. For your incarnation among us and for all that baby of Bethlehem means for us and our salvation, praise, praise, and pure praise. And all God's people said, Amen. Would you please rise in body or in spirit as you feel led and turn to number 242 as we sing together our closing hymn, Love Came Down at Christmas.
beyond the wait for the Messiah is almost over. We will gather together at 3 p.m. at Spruce Town and also 6 p.m. at St. James. And we will hear the story. We will sing the carols. We will watch a very moving video that shows what it was, was like for the shepherds that night, the night that Jesus was born, and what it meant for them. <clears throat> I ask that you would go from this space, carrying the love that transforms us in your hearts, that your lives may give birth to hope, peace, joy, and love wherever you go. Go now and know that God goes with you. Amen. And with a loving spirit, I ask that you would sing our response to that blessing and commission. Number 211, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, verse 4, and the words are on the screen. <clears throat> Oh, come, oh, 